Cal Perfect. <laughs> Recorded. Uh, very good. So we are now recording. <clears throat> and close that up there. Take care of that. And this is our Bible study for Sunday afternoon, February the 19th of 2023. And we had been going through several parts of, of Genesis 3 last week <clears throat> and, had, uh, and then had gotten to the point where we were going to talk about the externalization of religion, as I like to call it. <clears throat> and uh, the, there's a paper dealing with Genesis 4 and the, especially the externalization by Cain. <clears throat> And we'll go there in a moment. But before we go into that paper, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> let's uh, let's just touch base on a couple of things. The some of these last matters that were in Genesis three, and much of this has probably been very well explained through the years by by different preachers it's um uh, it has some things that needed to some help but we've also looked at some of those when we saw the nature of god's judgment on the woman and that she would have a desire a tushuka toward her husband and he would rule over or he would overrule her and just as we would see about cain with the the sacrifice, we saw that, and we, then we saw it in relationship to the Shulamite in, uh, in her relationship to Solomon in Song of Solomon. But <clears throat> so after Adam and Eve had uh, violated the design of God, and they have now experienced, notice, they have already experienced, it's important to see this, they've already experienced the the entrance of alienation from God in their life before he has even come into the garden to manifest himself and in this in the usual way. So they already they already know they have violated the the design of God. And keep in mind, this is one of those indications which says that the design of God and the person and nature of God are not two different things. They're not things of two different nature. His design is an expression of his person and an expression of his nature. And thus what he expresses, because he cannot be different and he cannot change and he cannot be false in any way, what he expresses, however he chooses to express it, is a perfect expression of his person and nature. And we'll, we've talked about that previously, but it's important to keep that in mind. And by the way, that is one of those foundational truths that is overlooked greatly by many, many um, who have been entrusted to preach and teach the Word of God. We'll just say it that way. So they heard the voice of the Lord God, of Yehia God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And as we were talking about in another class, uh, yes, when did we do that? That was, uh, was Friday. Friday. We were talking about in a Friday evening in our elementary Hebrew class, this idea of uh, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. If you keep in mind, see, if you always put everything in a proper context, at this point in time, Adam and Eve were still, they still had access to the garden. But you must remember that God had placed a layer of water above the rakia, above the atmosphere, and that layer of water would have created a a true greenhouse effect and and don't let don't don't worry about the modern day um physicists and so forth who say well you can never have a layer of liquid water up there if god can speak a creation into existence 
if he can make a woman out of this out of a, a rib a side of a man then i would submit to you he can put water anywhere he wants and it's only those who do not believe him as he has revealed himself who say that kind of thing because they think that they have knowledge and understanding that exceeds the knowledge and understanding that was manifest in what was written in the scriptures <clears throat> it's just another it's just another usurping of authority which was never delegated to humans and because they usurp authority they are walking in violation and walking in violation that will not be the only thing they don't understand there will be many 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 other things because they have they have set their heart to say no i will not buy that i know better than what the scripture says and when they do that that is a that's a that's exactly what the people at at uh, Babel at the Babel rebellion were experiencing and you know you'd say well why didn't he just stop them from building and then let them go on why do you have to change their language because God knew language uh, I think we dealt with that some last week didn't we Becca we did yes sir and and lest you wonder if you weren't in with us last week when we were with my son-in-law Jeff Setzer in uh, in his Sunday evening singing and scripture service, you need to realize one of the major issues that divides people of the present day is not is not just that they live in a different place. The major issue that divides is language. When when someone can speak in a language that you or I cannot understand we tend to be offended in some some measure when they speak in that language and we can't we can't determine what they're saying we don't know whether they're they're saying good things bad things what things and so that creates an alienation between individuals and so keep in mind god knew exactly what needed to be done to cause humans to disperse upon the face of the whole earth and that's what he did. And you must remember too, every language which he created at Babel was a perfect language because he created it. And thus, you say, well, was it like Hebrew? No, it wasn't like Hebrew. Hebrew is alphabetic. The language of Adam was the absolutely perfect one for all human beings to communicate. And that's why it stayed that way for probably close to 1800 years after creation but when people said we're going to take advantage of this common language and we're going to stay together and we're going to make a name for ourselves and we're going to rebel against god and that's what they were doing and because of that their languages needed their their language their one language needed to be made many so that they could not communicate and they would disperse from one another upon the face of the earth so you got to keep in mind the languages which god brought into existence at babel were perfect for the purpose of causing humans to disperse upon the face of the earth and that's exactly what they did now another point keep in mind uh and we are this is a little bit beyond what we were doing here but keep in mind there were other descendants of noah there were many descendants of noah through shem ham and japheth there were many descendants of noah who had come into existence and had grown up if you if you think about it if our the son of shem was born two years after the flood then our was substantially over a hundred years old by the time of the Babel rebellion, maybe even as much as 120 to 150 years old. And so when you think about that, he has had children and grandchildren and great grandchildren himself. And, and these people are there. Now, some of the descendants of Noah, doubtless, some of the descendants of Noah did not partake of the Babel rebellion because they had understood the instruction by god that they were to disperse on the face of the earth and and thus 
before the Babel rebellion occurred, they had already begun to disperse. And as uh, you and I have talked about some, Rebecca, we wonder if some of these uh, paleo Hebrew writings that have been found in places in North America could be uh, something that came from that very, those very people. Uh, because their language had not changed. They were not at Babel to, to need a new language to get them to disperse. They were already dispersing. Now, keep in mind another thing. When the people, you say, well, where are these people? What happened to them? Think about what would happen if you have a, if you have a godly group of people and then you begin to have a group of ungodly people, people who hate God, people who had already decided to, to rebel against God. And so then the ungodly come into contact with the godly. And if what, what happens, even the ungodly are going to fight against one another because each is seeking supremacy over the other. What would they do to the godly? Do you think they would just say, oh, you all are godly people. Oh, you've been here a long time. Oh, let's, let us follow you. No, they're going to say, you are a, well, as a matter of fact, I think it, that's what Cain did. Cain looked at his brother Abel, and we're going to see in a few minutes. He looked at his brother Abel, and Abel sacrifice that was acceptable to God when his was not. And he said, you are causing me to look bad. You and your godliness are making me to look ungodly. And that's grounds for destruction. And that's what they did. So you think about it. You, does, why, why aren't those people around all over the earth? Because of what ungodly people did. So that's another matter. And you say, well, where do you get that? I, can I prove it? I can't prove it. But I can tell you I can look at human beings in the present day. And I can tell you there are people even now who would like to kill all of us who are in this Bible study and get rid of us because they know we're problems to society as they deem it necessary to be. And, so, uh, yes. Just another point in connection with that. We know that um, the term Hebrew must have been applied to more than just Abraham's family because the Egyptians knew that the Hebrews were a distinct people group, and that's why they were able to call Joseph a Hebrew. Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. You know, we we take this so often, and, and it goes back to that same thing, Rebecca, that we have so, so common in our circles of what I call independent Baptist. And we say, we say, well, can you give me book, chapter, verse? And when they say, can you give me book, chapter, verse? I often think, no, I'm not going to waste my time on an idiot like you who's just saying, give me book, chapter, verse. And so uh, you say, that's mean, Brother Sheets. You need, to, you need to go back and you need to pay attention to what the Lord Jesus Christ did with those who withstood truth. And they say, oh, well, you can't prove that's the way it is. He was giving them the exact truth and they were rejecting it and rejecting him. And planning to kill him, to get rid of him, but they would not accept truth. And the, there is no difference today, there is no difference now among those who are legalistic Baptists. Believe me, they are still around. So anyway, so we have here, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Because he, had, he and Eve had hid, hidden themselves among the trees of the garden. And Adam says, I heard your voice and I was afraid. And think about it. this would have been the first experience of fear. And you say, well, oh, he was afraid. So, and the verb that we see is the common word for fear. And you've heard me say probably already. And if you haven't, you'll hear it at some point in time in the future that the fear of the Lord is not afraidness. The fear of the Lord is not an afraidness. And so Adam says here, I was afraid. 
I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. And here is the, down here in the Hebrew text, there's a word. It's the same root word from which we get the regular word, fear of the Lord. But consider what had happened, and uh, this is in another paper somewhere, and it, we may find it in one of these that we're going to be reading through. But, but keep in mind, what is, what is fear? Fear is an emotional response to a, shall we say, a desire, whether strong or mild, to not be subjected to the criteria of a certain person or persons or situation. So if we said, I fear having a, an, a car accident, I fear having an accident, what we're saying is, we have a, we have an emotional response that is saying we do not want to be subjected to the criteria of the physical world when we when we are involved in a serious car accident and that makes sense but the issue is when you take that meaning you take the emotion meaning and you put it back on the word fear and you say well the fear of the lord it's an afraidness of god then you need to realize that does not fit. It does not fit in most of the locations of scripture where the word fear, which is yare, where the word fear is used. It does not fit. But what does fit is the fear of the Lord. And you can go into Psalm 19, 7 through 9, and it's very, 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 very clear there. <clears throat> if you'll read it the way God wrote it, and um, and you find that the fear was just another word for the criteria of God's design. Those, those terms, the law of the Lord is perfect, the testimony of the Lord, the, the commandments of the Lord, the, the statutes of the Lord, the, the, the judgments of the Lord, and then the fear, six synonymous terms. That means fear is not an emotion. Fear as an emotion is what we experience when we violate the design of God. So keep in mind, you've got to think in terms of these things. Adam was not, for some reason, he's experiencing this fear because now he has an alienation has come into his heart between him and the creator. And that alienation has manifested to him basically that he is not right with God and he does not want to be subject to the undesirable circumstances that he expects to come. He had been warned about these circumstances, but he, but now he is violated and he's experiencing the, the alienation and, and that is an emotional reaction. He's experiencing that because he violated the criteria of God. But it's, so you got to keep that in mind. The issue was the violation. The issue is not the afraidness. And then he says, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God says to him, who told thee that thou wast naked? And hast thou, hast thou hidden it, eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the answer is yes. I did eat of it. And the man, interesting, he doesn't say, oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah, Lord, I did it. But now this is why. He begins with the reason. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave to me, gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Interesting. The Lord doesn't respond. But he says, what is this that thou hast done? And he says that to the woman. The woman gives her her reason. The serpent beguiled me. So she was deceived, and I did eat. Well, that's that's true, but there was still responsibility to maintain the design of God. And now notice, notice when with these, the Lord said unto the to the man, and he asked him, "What have you done?" He says unto the woman, "What is this you've done?" And then, when it gets down to the serpent, he says this because you have done this and notice here when he speaks to 
the serpent. He begins with, because you have done this. And then he goes on to describe the conditions that the serpent will experience. And then when he, the very next one, and he goes back to the woman and unto the woman, he said, he did not say to the woman, because you have done this. The woman had been deceived. That's what the scriptures say in uh, the, Paul's writings to Timothy. The woman was deceived. Adam was not deceived. And you'll notice the serpent was not deceived. The serpent had made an active choice of his will to mislead the woman and seek to cause the downfall of humans in the sight of God. And he was effective. But then you go down after God had said to the woman, no because, no because. He just says, but I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow, you're going to bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. We've already seen that. But it's something that, that perfectly fit. It's something that perfectly fit. It's as women would have children and they would have that experience of the labor and the sorrow and so forth, they would, there would be things, there would be a joy mixed with the, the fear of what is this child going to have to suffer and experience in life. And then there would also be that reminder. So it's going to be a constant reminder. And there's going to be that constant reminder that they're going to have a desire to their husband. They're going, they're going to basically try to rule over their husbands, just as Eve did by giving the fruit to her husband. She indicated her desire by giving. Remember, the scripture says she gave to her husband with her. Does not say Adam took it from her. It says she gave it to her husband. That means as she, in some way, either extending her hand or whatever, and she's saying to Adam, I want you to eat. That was her desire. Her desire was for Adam to eat and violate the design of God, which both of them knew. And Adam, not deceived, chose by an act of his will to do exactly that. He was not deceived. And thus, she has a, a quote-unquote judgment pronounced upon her to fit what she had done wrong. But then he says, because, to Adam, just like he said to the serpent, because, so he's going to give, here's the basis for why you're getting this. He had said up here, because, you, serpent, have done this. This is the basis upon which all of this is going to come upon you. And he says to Adam, because you hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, when he should not have, he should have overruled the voice of his wife, and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. The basic concept is you, man hearkened unto the voice of your wife in a matter which was not within the criteria of my design. That was what Adam did. He hearkened unto the voice of his wife when he was the head of the creation and she was the being having been, having been created by God, built by God to be a helper corresponding to him. And then God says, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. And you think about this. Now. After this point in time, and after Adam and Eve are forced out of the garden, they're going to be in a situation where the, the whole of the creation is not going to yield its strength to them as it had been designed to do. And life is going to be different. 
it's not going to be the the wonderful life that God had intended them to experience in the blessedness of the criteria of his design. They have violated. Alienation has come about, and it had never existed in them before. They now know what it is like to have experientially violated the design of God, and they have found that something in them changed, and they have they perceive now that the violation of the criteria of God was also a violation of his person. And folks, let me tell you, that is the very same thing today. And keep in mind, when we think about this, then I, I say that, well, if you violate the word of God, and, and there are too many people out there, they are everywhere, everywhere. And they're saying, well, as um, someone said, and I think you and I were talking about it the other day, Stephen, you know, someone someone makes a remark and says, well, how do you know what the scripture is? Well, they've been changed and you can't believe that what you have now and you can't believe the Masoretic text and you can't believe the Scrivener's text, uh, the, the TR over the other. You don't know which one is which and all of that. That's, it's sad. It's sad that that's the case in so many because the preservation of scripture, the preservation of the record of God has never been the province of humans. It has never depended upon humans to do so. Keep in mind, the, the revelation of God is not man's revelation of God. It is God's revelation of himself, and thus it is the responsibility, if you will, of God to preserve his revelation as he sees fit. That's why certain things are recorded and certain things are not recorded. It was not designed to be a history of the world that man could, could have gazillion volumes of writing that would tell every detail of what had happened in the creation since the beginning of time. It was not designed to be that way. And it is not designed to be a book of do's and don'ts so that you can walk the right way. It's a book that was designed to reveal the person and nature of the transcendent creator. That is the record. And it was begun by Adam. And you're going to see I refer to that just very shortly in another way too. And, um, and I can tell you, uh, since I have come to the conclusion of perceiving that the scriptures began with the hand of the first man, there have been many, many questions regarding content and so forth that have just evaporated. They are no longer a problem. And uh, you say, well, well, you don't believe Moses was the original writer of scripture. You're exactly right. I do not. Matter of fact, I have absolutely no doubt that Moses is not the original writer of scripture. When you look at the history of the text, and this is something that we have done in, in some of our advanced classes in, um, in the seminary here, where we work on how would the scriptures have been put together? and they give evidence, they give evidence that the first four chapters were written by the hand of Adam. And then they that everyone who knew who would be a subsequent individual responsible for those scriptures, for that record, they all knew they were to add as the Holy Spirit of God moved them. Listen, same thing. We talk about, you know, holy men of God, uh, wrote as they were born along by the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? Did holy men of God only come into existence in the New Testament era or in the, in the time of Isaiah or in the time of, of David or in the time of Joshua or in the time of Moses? Were there no holy men for the first 2,700 years of human history? And I submit to you, there were men who were holy, holy 
in a manner that we can't even imagine in our finiteness in this life. There were holy men of God, and there were holy men of God who were able to write because God had built into Adam that first language, and Adam began the record probably even before he and Eve left the garden. And that was not very long after they came into existence. But we have Adam. He called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And, and you, you say, why would God put that in there? Why would Adam have put that in at the, at, at the direction of God? Well, don't you think it would be important if she's the mother of all living? And you'll see, I, I give it a little different translation in a document we have to come. But unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And consider now, and we've heard this before, and it is true. Coats of skins don't just appear out of thin air. The coats of skins were coats made from the skins of animals. That is, something had to die for the Lord God to make the coats of skins to clothe his violating humans. And that becomes important <clears throat> because this is going to be the issue between the sacrifice, the offering of Abel, and the offering, the sacrifice of Cain. And Cain is going to externalize it. And we'll see that. So he made coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God, Yehyeh God, notice, notice how many times he says, Yehyeh God, Yehyeh God, Yehyeh God. Do you know what? It almost makes you think that the name Yihya or Echya, Echya would be I exist, or Yihya would be he exists. The only difference is a change in the person from first person with Echya, I exist, to third person, Yihya, he exists. You know what? It would almost give you the idea that that name had existed from the time of Adam. And would it not? Because Adam saw God as he was. There was no alienation until the man violated. The man could see and interact with the transcendent creator and in, in, in perfection. Nothing. What does that song say? Nothing between my soul and the Savior. There was nothing between Adam and God. until the man chose to violate. But then Yishyeh God said, and, and by the way, that's important because when Moses, when Moses in Exodus 3.14 asked God to give him the name that he could take to the children of Israel in Egypt as a, as a mark that he was indeed moved by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to lead them out of Egypt, the name that God gave him had to be a name that they knew before Moses was ever put into the writing situation. It had to be a name that they knew from previously existing documents that they had preserved through all the years intervening. And they had to have a name they knew. Or they'd tell Moses, get out of here, man. Take a hike. <coughs> and God said, I exist. And I submit to you when he said, I, I am that I am. <coughs> he was saying, I am. I exist. The one who's called I exist. And has been called that since the time of Adam. God was not just making a silly statement in English. He was making an absolutely perfect representation of his person. And then he told the man, when you go, you tell them that I exist. 
sent me unto you. And the name itself is a sentence. <clears throat> so, then Yahya God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Well, keep in mind, we talked about how did how would they know good and evil? They would know good and evil as God knows good and evil. That's what the serpent had said. And God doesn't have an external source to which he looks for, for knowledge of good and evil. He is the definition of good and evil. And so that's the whole point. Man wanted to be the knower, that is the determiner of good and evil for himself, just like God is the determiner of good and evil for himself. That's what Satan wanted. That's what man wanted. And now that's what we have. The only problem is everyone's definition is messed up. The only way we get it right is when we go back to the design of the Creator and find out what his definitions of these words are. So he says, Man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now to keep him from putting forth his hand and and in this condition of being one who knows good and evil, but is alienated from God, and, and he would take also the tree of life and eat and live forever? That was a totally unacceptable circumstance to God. Point being, God loved his human creatures, Adam and Eve, and all their future descendants so much that he was not willing for them to live forever in a state of alienation against him. That was love, folks. True love. God gave of himself to help his human creatures become all that he had designed for them to become. And that means they would have existed in a state of blessedness and success. Living forever in that state. But once they had violated, an alienation had come into existence. That could not be. The alienation would have to be removed, and then they could live forever. And he gave his son to that end. That was the design of God. So in love, the Lord God sent him, that's the Adam, and his woman. Notice, doesn't have to say, sent both a man and woman out. The man and his woman. The man and his woman. Not the man and his wife. The man and his woman. One man, one woman. One woman, one man. It becomes very clear. And the Lord Jesus Christ brought it out in the New Testament too. So he sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the, the man, and then he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, Kuruvim, cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the tree of life. Now, let's go over to a paper here, and let's look at something here. The first two verses are where we're going to focus initially. And then we'll go from here and we'll go into the section about externalization. But here in, the, in Genesis 4, verses 1 and 2, the English text says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife. And you'll notice I put over to the side, I put colors indicate different Hebrew conjunctions. The ones in orange are regular Hebrew conjunctions that would be translated and. And even the word but would be translated and. It doesn't have to be translated but. But is an interpretive translation. And do, did the King James use interpreted, interpreted translations? Yes, absolutely. Every person who translates from the original languages into another receptor language uses some form or to some degree interpretive translations. They have to because no two languages are exact. So, 
So we have, and Adam knew his wife. And we could say here, then, we do that below. And she conceived, and there came, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And notice, from Yehye. So she uses the name. She's not just saying, God help me. She's saying, Yehye, God help me. So, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but came with a tiller of the ground, and da, 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 da. And uh, there's another wow consecutive that follows there, though it doesn't appear that in the English text. And as you have seen already, as Rebecca has shown you multiple times, here's that, here are those, those wow consecutives. Here's the verb, ya yeah, that, that's the verb to know. It's a cal perfect third masculine singular in the first line. And then here's wa tahar. And there is the verb, there's your wa, wa with a pathak followed by a doggish forte. That's a wow consecutive. Then she conceived, wa tailed. Then she bore. There's another wow consecutive. Watome. Then she said. And then here's what she said. She says, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Watosef. Laleta. Then she added. Wayihi. Then it existed. Something existed. And you can see these wow consecutives. It starts off up here, and then a wow, 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 wow. And every main verb after that for a, a ways is a wow consecutive joining it back to that first statement that the Adam knew eth hawa ishto. He knew his woman, if you will. Okay. So let's go on down and you can see <clears throat> I gave you here this descriptive, descriptive literal translation and the Adam knew and her name was not Eve, it was Chawa, Chawa. And so, and the Adam knew Chawa, his woman. And that is a cow perfect up here. And you can notice the perfect. Then she conceived. Then she birthed Kayan. Then she said, I have acquired a man with Yihya. Not a man who was Yihya. That is not what she said. There are a lot of people that say, well, that could be, oh, she's gotten a man and she thought it was the Lord. No, that is not what she said. So then she caused adding to birth his brother, Hevel. Hevel is the word, the Hebrew name of Abel. We say Abel, but the word Hevel, which is the same word that is used in Ecclesiastes of things that are brief. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word vanity is the word hevel. It means basically brevity, where kayan means basically acquisition. Then hevel or abel means brevity. Now, does this mean that his life was going to be brief? See, this is what this is what people who don't know the scriptures will say. They'll say, Oh, oh my, since he got killed by Cain. His life was brief. He could have lived hundreds of years. <coughs> so therefore, <coughs> the name Hebel had to be added after the fact, after he died. You know, I think we could probably ask almost any woman who had had a child. And, and the experience of going through labor, I have, I have heard of women who have been in labor with the birth of a child for probably close to 24 hours, maybe some longer. And, and it's a very difficult thing for them to go through. It's not an enjoyable thing to go through. Yeah. We'll move just a minute. And so, so you think about it. But I've all, all re also known women who had very, very brief labor. And they were, and especially if they had had a hard labor or a long labor, and then they had a brief labor or an easy labor, they were very impressed by the fact that they had had a brief labor. The name Hevel is not because his life was brief or like a vapor. 
that it was vanity. It was of no value. That is not the meaning of the name Hevel. Hevel means something is brief. And thus, if he's somebody's named that, the name is not brief. His name would be something like brevity. And obviously referring to the fact that that Eve's labor with the birth of Hevel was a brief labor, and he was born, uh, shall we say, much easier than perhaps Cain had been. So, or Cain. So, we have, so then she called adding to birth his brother Hevel. Then Hevel, Abel, existed a shepherd of a flock, and that could be either sheep or goats, something like that, flock animals. And Cain existed, one serving the ground. That's literally what it's called. He was a farmer, I guess you'd say. Then it existed, and from the end of days, and that's a different way of saying it, but that's a Hebrew way of saying uh, it. After a while, this happened. Then Cain caused coming from the fruit of the ground, and we'll go on. But the issue that I want you to see here is you look down these. These, the, the words in orange are the ands. The words in yellow are the words that would be indicating some kind of a sequence. That is, they are consecutives. They're tying back to the original and up here, and the Adam new that verb right there new a cow perfect verb and then these are all wow consecutives on imperfect all the way down through and you said well what about the and here the and is a is tying the statement about hevel existing a shepherd of a flock and the statement about cayenne existed one serving the ground it's tying those two together just as a regular conjunction would. But the the then, 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 that continues in the first line of verse three. So now we go at that point, now we need to go down to this. And you can see these, all the consecutives and everything that are there. Okay, follow with me here. And I'm going to make a little more space here. So in this analysis, though honest questions may arise among believers regarding the nature of the births of Cain and Abel, and though others may concoct all sorts of myths regarding the births of these two men, including, and I'm I said it this way, including the idiotic anti-God conjecture that Cain was the offspring of Satan. The Hebrew text of Genesis 4, 1 and 2 it eliminates both all questions and conjecture. And by the way, when you you run into people and they say, well, you know, so, some people believe that Cain was offspring from Satan and, and that, that really Abel was the first child of Adam. Well, don't waste your time on idiotic people. Remember, the Lord did not go after the Pharisees and Sadducees who rejected him. The Lord taught those who followed with him and and you can see the same thing in paul when he went about to so the text originating from the hand of the first man himself and i have a footnote there is very explicit stating literally and the adam that's the word human knew how life his woman this statement is clear that Adam, the only male Adam then existing, was the progenitor of Cain through an intimate knowledge relationship with Eve, which resulted in Cain's birth. The text cannot be interpreted in any normal way to say anything else. So when you hear people say that, anybody who tends to put any stock in that you need to realize these people, one, probably do not know God at all. They probably have never experienced salvation. Matter of fact, I would have strong doubts about that, but I'm not going to say absolutely. But, but I mean, how can you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you and then you 
you contradict directly what God said. And what God said is the Adam knew Hawa, his woman. And that's what resulted in the birth of Cain. The text cannot be interpreted in any normal way to say anything else. The Hebrew text uses a very distinct construction which leaves no question regarding Adam's fatherhood of Eve's firstborn. Adam recorded the first statement using the verb knew. That's the verb yadha. And by the way, as you've learned from Rebecca, Hebrew words begin with their the syllables of Hebrew words begin with consonants. They do not begin with vowels. They begin with consonants. So therefore, when you look at that, you see ya, the yod is a consonant, the yod, excuse me, the y is a consonant, and the d is a is a consonant. The a with the two dots above it and the a with the little hat upside down on it, they are vowels. Thus, the word is pronounced ya, that, ya, that. You could say yada if you want to, but ya, that would be the Hebrew. So, Adam recorded the first statement using the verb new in what Hebrew grammar calls the, notice this, the perfect aspect. This terminology indicates that the verb is, is describing an action that was completed in the past or which is viewed as complete, thus making perfect aspect verbs the normal form for recording past events or expressing past actions. They are called perfect because they are expressing that the action of the verb is, in the mind of the speaker, completed, perfected, in the sense that it has been done and can no longer be changed. Keep in mind, you cannot go back and change history. When an action, or whatever it is, has been done, or even if it has begun, and it's, and it's still going on, you can't go back and unbegin it. It still began in the past. It, that is a perfect expression. Modern grammarians in Hebrew like to use the words, instead of saying perfect and imperfect, they'll use the words perfective and imperfective to try to keep away from the idea because people see, oh, it was perfect. So the action was perfect. That means it was just absolutely perfect. And that's, that's, that's just dumb, but um, be that as it may. So it's, it's an action that's been done and can no longer be changed. You can't go back in history and redo the action. The only one who could do that would be the transcendent creator himself. Important note, this is, a, this is something that you need to remember too. Yehye told both Abraham and Moses that Notice, he had given the land to Israel before they even entered it. He told Abraham that he had given the land to his descendants. A, he says, uh, the land I gave unto thy descendants. He says it to Moses, I gave. Those are perfect aspects. That means it was a done deal. That means the land belongs to Abraham's descendants and thus Moses' descendants, if you will. But you see, are they necessarily in possession of all that was given to them? No. But will they be in possession? Yes, because God will bring it about. And it was not fulfilled just in the time of David or, or Solomon. That's not, well, it was fulfilled and now it's over. That's another one of those things where people don't know the meanings of the words. So the next six primary verbs, that is verbs which are not in some way subordinate to a primary verb, are all in the imperfect aspect with a wow conjunction attached to each of them. And so this consecutive structure indicates that each of these primary verbs is bound to the preceding primary verb in some sort of sequence relationship. In modern English, each subsequent verb may be introduced by the conjunctions then, or you could say so in some cases, to better indicate this relationship than does the conjunction and. See, in English, in our King James Version and in many other versions, 
They don't distinguish between a wow conjunctive and a wow consecutive. They just use and, 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 and. And as we've talked about before, there are 50, there are 50 wow consecutives in Genesis 1. And they are, none of them are distinguished from the regular wow conjunctives. They are all translated and, 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 and. But that's not the way God wrote it. So, now, look at this simplified translation that I did here, verses 1, 2, and 3. So, we have this idea. Think about, and listen, think about the, the idea that's involved, the action. And Adam knew Eve, then she conceived. So, well, she didn't conceive before he knew. So, that means conceive comes after. Then she birthed. Well, birth didn't come before conceiving. Birthing came after. Then she said, after the birth, she said something. She said something about the child she had just gotten. The, her, her words about the child could not come until after she had birthed the child. So these are all, then she conceived, she birthed, she said, they're all sequential, sequential. After that, Adam knew, and they all one right after the other. Verse 2 begins with, then she added to birth. Now, looking at that sequence, then this seems to be that she added to birth after she had birthed her first child, but not, not that they were twins. So she added to birth, then Hevel existed, that is sequential, because until Hevel was born, and grew, he could not exist someone who tends a flock. And Cain couldn't exist someone who tilled the ground until after they had been born and they were grown. So the second line of verse 2, then Hevel existed, that is a sequential as well. And then we come down into verse 3, and then it existed, and it's from the end of days until we're talking about passage of time. Well, that would be sequential as well. So you have conceived, birth, said, that are sequential, existed and existed, that are sequential, and more coming after that. And then people want to say, well, then she added to birth. Well, that means that's just the same time. Is it, is it possible that someone could misunderstand it to be saying that she added to birth and thus that Cain and Abel were twins? Yes. It could be misunderstood that way, but not if you know Hebrew. And I'm not talking about having had a Hebrew course. I'm talking about being familiar with how the Hebrews wrote. And you say, well, Adam didn't know Hebrew. The language of Adam has, per has continued to exist throughout history, and it is now called Hebrew. So. The language of Adam is Hebrew, and Hebrew is the language of Adam at this present juncture of time. But some led astray by the English wording of the text and their English-only perspective have reached the erroneous conclusion that Cain and Abel were twins. Indeed, the English wording, and she again bear, may seem to allow such a conclusion, but the Hebrew text, the text as God actually gave it, corrects this error. Cain's birth is obviously the first of all humankind, and thus the word for twin, as it would be formed by Adam and Eve when she most likely bore twins, even triplets in the future, may not have existed at that moment in time. And Adam's text does not use the later word for twin. There is a word for twin. And if you go down to the bottom of that page, that footnote, the word twin is used, <clears throat> it's used to describe the relationship between Esau and Jacob as they were in her, in uh, their mother's womb, and Phares and Zara as they were in their mother's womb together. That word is used of twins there. The word is known in Hebrew, but it was not used in the text 
regarding the birth of Cain and Abel. <clears throat> so, now, as he was moved by, by the Spirit of God, Adam did not record in his beginning of the record of God, and there's a footnote, footnote down there for that too, a listing or even the number of individuals born to him and Eve. Later, his son Seth. See, Adam would pass the record to his godly son Seth. Sheth. Seth would add to the record only that his father had caused the birth of sons and daughters. He didn't say how many. And fulfilling God's design, Eve, during her own long life, must have given birth to a large number of descendants. <clears throat> Accordingly, the series of events described here in verses 1 and 2 covers a substantial number of years, encompassing the time from Adam's first knowing of Eve all the way to the time when Cain and Abel had sufficiently matured to produce and offer their own sacrifices. The time span for these events must have been at least 20 to 30 years, and likely even more. And many other children, both male and female, had been born to Adam and Eve. The Hebrew terminology and the verse break, which is minor, but it's there, between verses 1 and 2 are evidence against a twin birth. But another more obvious fact adds still more evidence. Consider this. In 6,000 years of human history, the evidence, that should be evidence, excuse me, is clear that God's design for human reproduction was that human births would normally involve, involve only a single child. Notice, normally, I said, involve only a single child. Multiple childbirths are not only potential within his design, but they would be exceptions. We know it today. We're still the same way thousands of years later. Accordingly, the creator would not have imparted a multiple childbirth, that is an exception to a single child design, in the first of all human births. That first human birth, though occurring after human violation, would have been exactly as he intended, one child per birth. Interestingly as well, God confirmed this aspect of his design in the perfect single child birth of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can there be any question that the birth of Jesus Christ was not absolutely perfect? and thus it would be perfectly expressive of the design of God. Still further, Adam used in verse 2 a verb that is the feminine singular of the Hebrew hyphial stem to add, and he combined, uh, combined it. How do you read through these things and not find that? And he com combined it with the Hebrew infinitive construct of the verb to birth. Rebecca just talked about Hebrew infinitive constructs. The hyphial stem indicates that the subject she, it's a subject, feminine singular, she is actively causing, that's the hyphial, the action of her bearing able. Pay attention, this is important. She caused adding to birth able. Not Adam caused adding to birth Abel, but she, Hawa, Eve, caused adding to birth Abel. So this indicates that the subject, she is actively causing the action of her bearing Abel. That is, the combination may be translated, then she caused adding to birth, or then she added to birth. Though somewhat awkward for English thinking individuals, these translations capture the Hebrew significance, not only that some interval existed between the two single child births, and that would be of Cain and Abel, but also that Eve, pay attention, Eve had been actively involved in bringing Abel into existence. Obviously, her experience of bringing Cain into the world, and perhaps her other children as well, had awakened in her the desire for more children. Like her man, 
she had already experienced enough of the fallen condition of her existence to make her desire to conform to the creator's design. And she was Hawa, the mother of the entirety of living. That's a literal translation there. She's the mother of the entirety of living. Abel was not some accident of nature resulting from the physical union of a man and his woman. Abel was the result of a woman desiring to be used by the creator to bring a new human into existence. Eve desired Adam to know her and fulfill with her God's desire for them to fill the earth with their progeny. In his record, Adam did not to restate that he had known Eve again. His knowing was an integral aspect of the perfect design of God for begetting children. Indeed, because the scripture indicates Eve to be the one causing the adding to birth, the significance appears to be that she was the one who initiated the action leading to her conception, especially as she recognized that the time had come when her body was ready to bear another child. Whether or not she initiated the knowing action, the text indicates that both Adam and Eve were willing parties to the fulfillment of God's perfect design for filling the earth. The evidence is then clear. Cain and Abel were not born of different fathers, nor were they twins. Each had come into life through a single childbirth with some unknown interval of time between them. So, any thoughts or questions? They were not twins, and they were not born of two separate fathers. <clears throat> the only people who come up with that stuff, uh, to say it nicely, are self-focused idiots, and they are wrong in the most absolute sense, misleading. And so don't be led astray by those people. And when you, and when you, you know, sometimes when you're being taught by someone, you need to ask. If you have questions about their theology, ask them about something like this and find out what they say. And if they're mealy mouth or if they just plain come up with, with something that's ungodly about it, just don't let them teach you. Get out of there. Let them go. You can't be, you won't be the one to correct them. Teachers don't typically allow students to correct their theology. So any thought before we leave that? Let's go over to this, this idea of Cain, Abel, and the externalization of religion. And you can see I put externalized prayer is not communication with God. Just because someone stands up and is supposed to be praying, if they are praying, and we have many, many, many of these that we have in public, they are externalized prayers. And externalized prayers are not communication with God. They're just words. And then I have some in here about the results of externalization and one aspect of that being Cain's slaying of evil, evil, eh, of hevel. <laughs> now, keep in mind, the externalization of religion is the doing of a religious activity as a requirement of a being or the religion associated with a being, whether real or imagined, apart from a full internalized perception of the person and nature of that being. By the way, uh, I, have, I have dealt with, uh, I've met Muslims who uh, would tell you they believed in Allah, they, go to, they do temple, they do all the stuff they're supposed to do as Muslims, but they did not believe in Allah period. They're just like Christians that don't believe in God. They, they are all out there in all religions. They just do those things. And this is what the end of that paragraph, 
Humans have made their relationship to God a matter of doing religious practices and appearing to hold to certain religious concepts in ways which make their worship visible to and discernible by other humans, themselves included. Indeed, the doing and appearing to hold have become so deeply entrenched in the human concepts of a relationship to God that even the doers and appearers to hold believe that their externalized worship is the very definition of true worship. And that's, boy, is that prominent in our circles. I mean, you think about it. Why would you call a Sunday morning service a worship service? And you say, well, because we worship. That's a good question. I'm not going to go there. And I would say, I would say, most of what is done in the name of worship is not worship of God. So, now what about Adam's externalization? Adam, as a being who walked with God, could not have comprehended. Think about this. You got to go back and see what Adam's walk with God was before he violated. He could not have comprehended living an existence where he would not have a continuous and complete sense, not only of the presence of the creator, but also the total harmony of the relationship between them. Nothing existed, either in concept or experience, which adversely affected his interaction with the God who had made him. Thus, when God expressed a specific criterion of his design, instructing him to not eat of a certain tree, the man possessed no concept of that of what that violation, I'm sorry, of what violation of that criterion or any other criterion of God's design would bring. He had no experience of the results of violation. He knew the design to not eat, and he knew the condition, dying you will die, would result if the design were violated but death had not yet been experienced. Within the design of God, Adam had many times already applied the creator's design, assimilating information, correlating it to his world and the design of God, and then making wise decisions based upon his correlations. With no propensity toward violation, his decision to eat from the forbidden tree was, in his mind, in his mind, but another application of what he was designed to do. Adam recorded the basic element of the creator's design. That's in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And we've talked about that before. Expressing that the creator had built into each human both a measure of authority and a sense of that authority. The human thus thought himself to possess sufficient authority, authority delegated to him by the creator, to evaluate the conditions related to eating of the tree, but he exceeded that authority and reached a conclusion that superseded a clear criterion of God's design. The creator had designed him to perform such evaluations and reach conclusions. They were to be a part of everyday life, but God had never delegated to Adam any degree of authority which allowed him to violate any criterion of his design. Thus, Adam violated the design of God, and he and Eve entered a new condition of their existence. They had come to know experientially, but the nature of a violation of the Creator's perfect person and the alienation which violation brought. And we're really at time, so might be best not to Go on, it would take probably another 10 minutes or more to do the Cain externalization there, just that part. So, so how many?